Hey guys, I hope you're doing well. Um, I hope you're enjoying your STEM week. I'm just going to give you um, a pretty short lecture um, about the rule of King Louis. We talked about on, what was it, Monday, about absolutism. Um, but I want to give you some specific details. Um, essentially, this is a summary of your reading. I know your readings are really long, this section. Um, so this will be a good way to kind of summarize what you've read about and hopefully start to put the pieces together, um, especially about King Louis. Um, he's such an important absolute ruler that it's important to try to get a whole picture of who he is and who his policies are. Um, so you're going to see this picture of Louis a lot. This is one of my favorites, especially because of da, 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 that hair do right there. Pretty sweet. Um, so basically what we're doing today, kind of the map of where we are going, is we're going to look at kind of four major parts of his rule. First, his economic policies. We're going to look at the Colbert Report. Um, and then we're going to look at religion, and he's going to spoiler learn, although you should already know this since you read about, about it. So he's going to get rid of the Edict of Nantes, which we spent so much try time learning about and getting to. He's going to wipe that away. We're going to look at some of his socio-cultural policies um, with French classicalism and look at his kind of military um, programs in his expansion. So here we go. Also, pay attention before we get going. Look at another sweet hairdo. Uh, he did wear lots of wigs. He had very expensive wigs um, that he wore and that were made specially for him. And you can see them, they get, I think they get bigger over time as he gets older. So let's see if we can pay attention to that. So economics, oops, wrong Colbert, wrong one. So, what he was all about, uh, see, so you can see how I was confused. They almost look the same. Um, but the economic system that's going to be used, or sorry, going to be used by absolute rulers, especially King Louis, is one called mercantilism. Essentially, this is a collection of government policies um, for the regulation of economic activities of the state. Basically, you're starting to see... Um, the state have more and more control over economics um, and they're starting to have more regulations over economic activities of the state and by the state, um, which is going to be a big part of what Colbert, which is Louis's um, Minister of Finance, kind of what he's all about here. All right, so he had, as you've seen, uh, France's finance minister at the time uh, was named Colbert. And basically what he's going to try to do is he's going to try to balance France's trade. Um, at this point, or prior to Colbert, they were kind of importing a lot of goods, um, meaning a lot of their money is going out of their country. So he wants to balance that trade um, and make it so France is more self-sufficient. So the flow of gold... Um, to other countries is halted. Essentially, they want to keep the money within their country. So he's going to encourage French industry. That includes having higher foreign tariffs, meaning it's more expensive if you're going to buy, let's say you're going to buy a pound of butter. It's more expensive to buy German butter than it is to buy French butter because there's going to be a really high tariff on that German butter. So essentially, it's, think of it today, it's, you know, how there's that buy local movement, right, where people are trying to buy stuff made near where it's produced. That's essentially what Colbert's doing, is he's trying to make it so people um, buy French products. Um, and he's also going to encourage a really strong merchant marine, uh, basically trying to keep the economics, keep the economic production and consumption of France within France. Um, he's also going to try to um, continue that colonization effort. He's going to be the um, a main pusher to get Canada under France's control. That's just kind of a side note. Um, but something to take note of. This is going to be something that's going to factor into when we eventually look at the French Revolution, is that Yes, France's industry is going to grow a lot. Their commercial class is going to prosper and do extremely well, but the agricultural economy is going to suffer a lot. 
Um, part of that is because there's a heavy tax burden for farmers. Um, at this point, um, farmers took on, essentially, at this point, nobles don't pay any taxes at all, right? Because part of King Henry, uh, King Henry, excuse me, King Louis's policies is to get the nobles on his side. So he doesn't tax them. And who he's going to tax are going to be kind of your everyday people. And a heavy burden of that is particularly going to fall on the farmers. Um, so there's going to be heavy tax burden for farmers and a series of really poor harvests. Um, there's going to be a population decline. There's going to be a lot of issues in the agrarian sector of France, which at this point is still the largest sector. So yes, the kind of commercial merchants are going to start prospering, but the majority of people are going to have a decline in their overall quality of life during this point because of the economic policies of King Louis and Colbert. All right, so we're gonna move on. Remember, you can get all this information from our class website. Um, it's all posted now, so if you want to go look, it is posted. Um, as well as our YouTube page, you can find it there. All right, so main ideas, mercantilism, Colbert trying to balance trade, um, that the French industry grows, but there's going to be an agricultural economic suffering within France. All right, so remember last unit, our religious wars, we spent so much time looking at the French Civil Wars, and the solution was the Edict of Nantes, or not necessarily the solution, but the end result was the Edict of Nantes, which was a solution for the time. But King Henry's gonna, not King Henry, I keep saying that, King Louis, excuse me, King Louis, our son king, uh, revoked the Edict of Nantes in 1685. So um, just about 100 years later, he's going to revoke it. If you remember, the Ibnats gave Huguenots essentially rights as citizens, as the right to practice their religion. Um, but Louis is going to get rid of that. He's going to make it legal, again, to be Protestant. He's going to destroy Protestant churches. He's going to destroy Protestant schools. Um, and that's going to cause many Huguenots to actually flee France. They're just going to leave entirely. Especially because it is so close to be able to go to... Uh, the Netherlands, it's going to be close to go to Germany's in order to get to a place that has some religious tolerance. Others are going to move to the New World as well. Um, so why would he do this? He, you know, we spent so much time looking at this religious conflict and it seemed like this was a solution for religious toleration. But Louis did this for essentially two reasons. One is that he thought this would eliminate the division within France. He saw the division in religion as a problem towards achieving a united France. Essentially, he wants to create a complete French identity with complete loyalty to him as an absolute ruler. And he saw this as a division that you couldn't fully be loyal to him if there's these divisions within France, you couldn't be loyal to one another if you're a Protestant and your neighbor is a Catholic. But, I mean, he wouldn't have done this if it wasn't popular, meaning he had a lot of public support for this policy. At this point, Catholics still far outnumber the Protestants, and it was supported by a majority of the population. So again, you're like, oh, we spend so much time trying to get to the Edict of Nantes with the French Civil War, and only 100 years later, it's going to be undone. All right, again, just to summarize, Louis revokes the Edict of Nantes. Um, Huguenots flee, and he did this to eliminate divisions, and because he had public support for this policy. All right. So, moving onwards. Alright, so looking at what his socio-cultural rule looked like. And he's really going to be the, in a way, the creator of 
French classicism. Not that he's a painter, but he's going to be a patron to create this unique French, kind of French classical Baroque style. So kind of what French classicism is, is art of the French court. It's often called classical French Baroque. It's going to be very different in style from Italian Baroque. If you look at even this picture, it looks a lot different than the picture on the back wall done by Caravaggio. The one where um, St. Paul is getting trampled by the horse. It looks a little different. You're going to see it's much more classical looking clothing that looks like you know, clothing you would have seen in an ancient Greek or Roman kind of garb. Um, you see kind of a different background. You're going to see a different style entirely. And we'll talk about that in a sec. All right. So part of the reason why this distinct style emerges is because Colbert um, helps to establish under King Louis a essentially royal control over art production. Oops, I didn't finish where it says there. What it's supposed to say where it says setting. It's trying to say setting, essentially style. There's going to be a creation, I don't know why it says setting there. Ignore that right where it says it. Da -da -da. Setting. Just ignore that. Pretend that's on there. Sorry about that. So because art production, whether it's paintings, whether it's music, a lot of the art is going to be essentially under royal control. I think again, this is another aspect of absolutism. And a lot of the art is going to be used to promote Frenchness. It's going to be used to promote the glory of France. You can kind of see that here. You have very kind of heroic um, classically inspired figures um, and the idea is really to use art to promote the French national identity under King Louis. All right so sorry about that setting, don't need it there. Um, kind of the most emblematic artist is Poussin who painted this picture here. Um, and it has essentially emblematic of classical idealism where you have these Greek or Roman figures. They're going to have, in a way, I'm going to write on in here. You're going to see they have almost sculpture-like bodies. Very classically inspired. Even their footwear <laughs> is classically inspired. Their dress. Um, this is actually cropped a little bit so you can see it, but there are going to be grand scale, very, if you look at the setting in the background, very grand, um, oftentimes natural settings, but a lot of times natural within a Greco-Roman scape. Um, but Louis the Fourteenth is essentially a very, um, big promoter and patron of the arts, especially of different composers that are going to have a very uniquely French um, Baroque style. So you're going to have some composers down here, Lully, Copern, and Charpentier, excuse my French, um, and some different playwrights. There's going to be a big emphasis of the arts at Versailles itself. Um, you have a big palace, you got to fill it with lots of different artwork, and that artwork is is all going to have a purpose. And that purpose is to make France and to make King Louis look awesome. So keep that in mind. You're going to see some artwork. All right, guys. You're doing good. You got one more slide. It's a, a bit of a doozy. But you'll be able to do it. So French classicism. Colbert establishes that royal control over art production. And... Lots of classical idealism by Poussin and by different composers and playwrights who were, whose patron was King Louis. All right, 
last but not least. So, we're gonna see a lot of war <laughs> under King Louis. I couldn't come up with a better way of saying it. A lot of war under King Louis. Um, he's at war for 33 of his 45 year rule. So, of his 45 years that he's king, 33 of those are going to be years at war. Um, and part of the reason why he's able to do so and why he does so is because he, because he creates a truly modern army. And he's, he does that with the help of Marquis de Louvois, who... Um, is a nobleman and is one of his advisors that really helps create a modern army. This is a big switch here. Basically, when I say it's modern, I mean that the French army under King Louis is essentially employed by the state rather than nobles. Prior to this, the nobles were the ones who were the commanders and they're the ones who would go to their essentially local area that they controlled to recruit soldiers who would fight under them for France. Instead, kind of King Louis is going to cut out that middle middleman. He's going to cut out the nobles and jump straight to the people. So the state is going to employ soldiers similar to the way our government employs soldiers today. You're not necessarily soldiers of the Bay Area who then goes and fights for the United States. You're United States, part of the Army, Air Force, etc. So he's really going to create a modern army. And he's going to use that to help France expand. So he's going to continue King Louis the Fourteenth is going to continue, going to continue the policies of Richelieu. Oh, sorry, that's spelled incorrectly there. It's missing a little E there. Sorry about that. It's going to continue those expansionist policies. France is going to, going to continue looking around to try to gain more land and more influence. Because remember, land is power at this point. And still in many ways today. All right, so let's take a look at what he does. So one of the first things he does in 1667 is he invades Flanders. And after his initial push, she is able to gain 12 different towns. And about a decade later, by 1678, he gains some more, more towns um, by signing the treaty of Nim, I can't say this word. <laughs> Treaty of Nim again. I apologize. I'm totally butchering that. Um. So remember, Flanders used to be essentially a province of France. Remember, all the way back to the Hundred Years' War, it used to be a province. So France sees themselves as being essentially owners of the Flanders. Although the Flemish don't see it that way at this time. Um, so they're looking to regain some of their seemingly historical land. Um, and something to keep in mind, because he's going to, King Louis is going to continue his expansion policies, that taxes are going to fall on the peasants. Remember, the nobles are not taxed. So the taxes are going to fall on the peasants, who are going to revolt. Essentially, kind of intermittently, they're going to revolt. No huge revolts or rebellions um, that you need to know specifically. But know that essentially every time King Louis expands outwards, there's kind of internal turmoil that arises because the burden of taxes proportionately falls on the peasants. So Louis is going to fight some different wars. He's going to fight against England. He's going to fight against the League of Augsburg. He's going to fight um, kind of all throughout the Habsburg Empire. But the most kind of important war that he fights is called the War of Spanish Succession. 
It was fought from 1701 to 1713, so a little over a decade. Um, because Louis claims Spain. Essentially, there's um, some debate about who should be next in line to the Spanish throne. And at this point, there's a lot of intermarrying um, between the Austrians, the Spanish, the French. Um, and King Louis does have a claim and a strong claim to the throne. But he is going to be opposed by everyone. <laughs> because if France and Spain unite, you can see that would throw off the power, the balance of power within Europe. So, Louis is going to claim France. Excuse me, here he has France. Louis is going to claim Spain. But he is going to be opposed by the Dutch, the English, the Austrians, and the Prussians, who are... Prussia is around modern-day Berlin. So essentially, everyone's going to fight against him to stop him from getting Spain because that would kind of throw the power totally off the power balance in Spain. In Spain, excuse me, in Europe. <laughs> it would throw off the balance of power in Europe if France were to acquire Spain. Um... So a grand alliance, those names I said, of the English, Dutch, Austrians, and Prussians were formed to fight the French in 1701. So it's called the Grand Alliance. And again, it's composed of the English, the Dutch, the Austrians, and the Prussians. Essentially, why it's such a big deal is they don't want, of course, the balance of power within Europe. Plus, if France were to gain all of Spain's overseas territories, that would make Spain and France united. That would make them complete, completely dominant over the rest of Europe with all those overseas holdings and trade, and gold, and access to resources. So, essentially, the rest of Europe looks at this and says, you know, this is a no-go. We can't let this happen. Um, there's a several different battles... You don't need to know the specific details. Um, but essentially, Louis loses um, because the war ends with what's called the Peace of Utrecht in 1713. I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong. So basically what it did is it forbade the union of France and Spain. So the alliance was victorious over Louis and made it so he could not take over Spain. So that a union between France and Spain cannot happen. Which makes sense. Essentially, Spain at this time, as you remember from your reading, although it's been, it's actually in a state of decline, it is still extremely wealthy, but it's, it's not going to be the great power it was the century previous to it. But France, at this point, is on the rise. So if you unite them together, you'd have a complete powerhouse in Europe. And the Grand Alliance would not allow that to happen. Think of it as a giant game of risk. You can't let them get too much of the territory. So the War of Spanish Succession essentially ends French expansionism. And it really does leave France on the bank, brink of bankruptcy once again. This is a theme we're seeing a lot, right, in France, that they are constantly in this economic turmoil because um, of the decisions of their leaders, especially in terms of military decisions. Um, there's going to be kind of a lot of widespread misery. Um, there's going to be a lot of revolts, a lot of internal turmoil. Um, that in many ways is going to be a theme that sticks with France during the 18th century up until the French Revolution. So we're starting to plant the seeds here and now that we'll see in units later when we look at the French Revolution. So again, kind of to recap what we just saw, is that Louis was at war for 33 of his 45 years. And he developed that modern 
army, that modern conception of, of a standing army where the state is going to employ the soldiers rather than the nobles. It's going to continue expansionist policies, but the burden of those policies economic-wise is going to fall on the peasants. War of Spanish succession is caused by a kind of vacuum in Spain where there's it's unclear who who should be the next ruler of Spain. Louis claims it. The Grand Alliance realizes that would mean that France, if it were to be united with Spain, would be a complete powerhouse that would be able to dominate the rest of Europe. So they formed the Grand Alliance to ultimately defeat Louis, creating the Peace of Utrecht, which forbade the union of France and Spain, ending France's expansionist, pol expansionist kind of policies in the 18th century, and left France really on the brink of bankruptcy and complete widespread economic and social misery for the majority of the population within France. All right, you survived. <laughs> Hopefully. Hope no one's dropped dead so far. So you should have also read about um, the decline of absolute Spain last night in your reading. Kind of where you're going to be going tonight is you've looked at absolutism, especially focusing on absolute France. But tonight your reading is going to switch gears and start looking at constitutionalism. Essentially, it's not necessarily the opposite of absolutism, but it's going to be absolutism checked, where the state has to be governed according to law rather than royal decree. And I'll have another kind of lecture for you tomorrow to go through what constitutionalism is. I'll either have it for you tomorrow um, or the following day. And a lot of the reading is going to focus on, it's going to be, a chunky reading, um, but it's going to really, it's going to be review. A lot of it will be review from last year. So do the best you can with it. It'll go through um, the English Civil War, the, you know, under Cromwell, it'll look at the restoration of the English monarchy, it'll look at the Glorious Revolution. So hopefully some of those terms might <laughs> be coming back to you as you read it. Do the best you can with it. Um, I'll give you some information tomorrow about the Stuarts. Very interesting. This is one of my favorite parts of history. And I'm so sorry I can't be with you for it. Um, do the best you can with it. I hope you enjoy it. Um, and I'll talk with you guys soon, okay? Hope you're all doing well. Take care. Bye-bye.